Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, I would like to start by thanking Aspire and uh, the scientific committee of uh, this uh, very interesting webinar uh, for the invitation to discuss on a very hot topic. Uh, I think that all of us have come across patients with thin endometrium and they are particularly hard to treat patients. So it has been a very exciting webinar to attend and also um, you know, a great uh, uh, honor to be a part of. So I've been asked to talk to you about the therapeutic management of uh, uh, thin endometrium uh, using hormones. And that's what I'm planning to do in the next uh, So I would like to start with my disclosures. These are my disclosures for the past three years. I do not think they're particularly relevant to this presentation, but I would still like to not make sure you're aware of them. So we've already heard about what um, thin endometrium is, and I'm pretty sure that this presentation or this uh, systematic review has already been covered by previous speakers. Uh, we do know that there is uh, an elusive uh, definition of what thin endometrium is. For some researchers, it is very thin, uh, five or six. For others, it might be even lower than 10 uh, millimeters. Uh, however, in a systematic review and meta-analysis that was published in 2014, uh, performed by Frank Bookmans and his group, they were able to identify 20 eligible studies and nine out of 22 were prospective. And the definition of endometrium, as we discussed, varied widely and went as low as six millimeters. But generally, 10 out of 22, almost 40% of um, these studies, agreed that the cutoff should be around seven millimeters. Using this cutoff, it was calculated that uh, this is observed in about 2.4% of patients. So it's not very common, and that's very good for us, but at the same time, it's not as uncommon uh, that it hasn't, um, we haven't come across it uh, during our careers. I think that many of us have come across these cases multiple times. And clinical pregnancy has been shown to improve the more you increase your endometrial thickness, uh, up to a point usually of about 10 millimeters after which you do not easily observe um, a detectable uh, increase. And uh, hormones and endometrium, as we know from basic reproductive physiology, uh, are so uh, closely linked together. Uh, they're very important because just by looking at the menstrual cycle, we know that uh, the reason why the endometrium grows is under, predominantly under the action of estrogen. The estrogen acts by binding uh, on, uh, uh, acts on the endometrium by binding on the two estrogen receptors, alpha and beta. And that leads to a prolific response in the endometrium. Uh, and one thing that might not be uh, very clear is that the, the bulk of the endometrial thickness is actually contributed by uh, a strong edema in a way. Glands, of course, show a high number of mitosis as well and become elongated, as you can see on this graph on your left. And generally speaking, the endometrium for most women would grow uh, as a single surface. Remember that when we're measuring the endometrium, we're actually measuring um, the, um, uh, both uh, the anterior and the posterior surface. So we're measuring two surfaces on the endometrium. But as a single surface, the endometrium will grow from about 0.5 millimeters, which is when it's um, uh, menstrual endometrium, to 3.5 to 5 millimeters on average, which would uh, translate in about 7 to 10 millimeters of endometrial thickness. Another very important action of estrogen is that it induces formation of progesterone receptors, which means that it creates, um, uh, that it uh, prepares the endometrium for its secretory transformation, which is so fundamental uh, for the achievement of pregnancy. So let's go now into the actual thin endometrium what potentially hormonal treatments can we uh, uh, use? Uh, considering that estrogen stimulates endometrial growth, it would be only uh, very um, uh, normal to see whether we can use different types of estrogen, whether you know, we can manipulate the dose, the route of administration, whether it's oral or some other route. And another interesting question would be, can we modify the duration uh, uh, during which we administer estrogen. Other hormonal treatments that have been uh, suggested is tamoxifen, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, ACG injections during uh, the follicular phase, mid-luteal generator uh, agonist injections have also been trialed, and recently there has been some activity around the potential value of growth hormone for these patients. And these are uh, the interventions that I will review in the next few slides. 
So starting with natural estrogen, again, this is a very basic diagram where you can say how you, you can see how estradiol predominantly uh, comes uh, to the conversion of testosterone by aromatase, and that usually happens in the granulosa cells, uh, but also in the periphery, in the adipose tissue. But at the same time, estradiol is converted through the 17 beta hydroxysteroid the hydrogenase to estrone. And there is almost a balance between those two, uh, depending on different conditions, and an equilibrium is achieved. Uh, so we have estrone, we have estradiol, which is by far the more potent uh, estrogen that we have. Estrone is weaker. Estriol, which is produced mainly from the placenta. And a fourth estrogen that uh, you know, many uh, have, might have forgotten, which is the estrogen, and is produced predominantly by the, the fetal liver. As I said, estradiol is the most potent, both in terms of affinity with estrogen receptors, but also in terms of uh, uh, the effect that it can induce. So in terms of what type of estrogen and how should we be administering estrogen, we need to understand that there are four potential routes through which we can administer it. Oral, which is the most common one, transdermal, vaginal, and intramuscular. And uh, evidence originating from artificial cycles for frozen embryo transfers has shown that it doesn't appear that either the type of estrogen or the route of administration has an effect on the success rate of programmed FETs. That doesn't necessarily mean that they, they, this would equally apply to uh, patients with thin endometrium, but that's something very important to note. So oral estrogen uh, has been used extensively for endometrial growth and has been studied. It was one of the first things uh, that we started using. It's a simple, well-tolerated uh, intervention. The standard dose um, uh, of estradiol valerate is about six milligrams per day. Having said that, we do know that there are different protocols in different centers, some of which involve a step-up protocol, trying to mimic the natural increase uh, in serum estradiol levels of the natural cycle. And these sometimes have been tested, particularly in the context of preparing the endometrium for a frozen embryo transfer cycle, but no clear benefit has been demonstrated. So on the basis of this, using this step-up uh, method doesn't appear to confer any benefit. What about the dose of oral estrogen? Uh, it's important to note that there is no standardization in these women and no proper studies have been performed comparing different doses. And uh, we do know based on either cohort studies or case series or even case reports that doses as high as 16 milligrams per day have been used with successful, uh, with, with the pregnancy. And uh, we do know obviously that continuous unopposed estradiol administration uh, can have some side effects. So another important question is for how long could we be potentially uh, offering this treatment in patients with uh, refractory thin endometrium? Uh, based on a few studies that have been performed, and these studies are mostly case series or cohort studies, it appears that estradiol administration can be uh, given for up to nine weeks, after which we do seem to have um, uh, breakthrough bleedings and potential risk for hyperplasia. So we should always keep these things in mind. But uh, the old dogma that you should not extend the follicular phase beyond two to three weeks, because that affects uh, uh, the um, receptivity of the endometrium, seems not to hold true, particularly if we take into account these publications. And one thing that's very important to understand is the first pass metabolism that uh, most steroids have when they uh, are administered through the oral route. What is that? It's the, the the fact that the uh, oral estradiol is extensively metabolized by the liver and the uh, intestinal mucosa, and it also exerts effects in the liver. And these effects can be uh, uh, augmenting the synthesis of renin and affecting, in many cases, favorably HDL and LDL, but at the same time, augmenting the production of coagulation factors, CRP. And therefore, it could increase the risk of cardiovascular or uh, particularly thromboembolic disease, which is a very important concern. And another reason that we need to, uh, another important um, side effect of the first oral pass is the fact that out of the estradiol, particularly the natural estradiol that we administer, uh, studies have shown that we will end up with only a two to 10% of bioavailable uh, estradiol, which means that most of the actual dose we're giving is not 
um, translated into a therapeutic effect, whereas it could increase the risk of, for example, thrombosis. And that led many researchers to consider in cases where we do need to give high doses of estrogen and then for a prolonged period of time, should we potentially consider alternative uh, routes of administration? So intramuscular is um, a way that has been proposed. Unfortunately, it does come in oil and it's very, very painful. And so it's probably not the, uh, the most patient uh, friendly when it comes to a prolonged administration. And transdermal and vaginal are the two routes that have been used particularly and have been trialed particularly in women with uh, female endometriosis. And uh, their uh, major advantages, they bypass the first pass effect, and which means that they offer a better safety profile. At the same time, considering that uh, these uh, estrogen do not go through the conversion to estrone, which is a much, much weaker uh, um, uh, estrogen um, uh, when they are administered by the transdermal or the vaginal group, that means that potentially they have much higher bioavailable uh, estrogen, which could uh, lead to a meaningful difference when it comes to endometrial growth. Uh, what about transdermal estradiol administration in women with Do What evidence do we have? We do know that it is the one that leads to the most steady state levels of estrogen, as less of it is converted to estrone. But at the same time, the first pass metabolism uh, is probably one of the factors for which we see that the bioavailable estrogen between individuals using the same dose can be so different, despite, for example, having similar body mass or weight, but at the same time, even within the same um, person, depending on other enzymes that are augmented and used uh, in the liver, we could see a significant variation in the serum concentration of estrogen when we're just administering orally. This is bypassed when we administer um, estrogen transdermally. So it does present uh, with uh, some significant advantages. So this high ratio of estro estradiol to estrone may benefit endometrial growth due to the greater affinity of estradiol uh, for both estrogen receptor alpha and beta. But sometimes, particularly when we need high doses, it may be inconvenient as multiple patches might be required. And these patches usually need to uh, change every two to three, every two to three days, twice a week. So dermal gel is another uh, version which might mitigate some of these problems. So with a vaginal estrogen administration, when we have endometrium, we still achieve the same effect. We bypass the first uh, uh, pass uh, metabolism, and we do achieve high concentrations of estradiol in the serum and in the endometrium. And we have natural and conjugated estrogen cream or ethanol estradiol tablets or estradiol pessaries that can be used. The patients might find the vaginal route sometimes convenient, but other times it can be more difficult. And in cases where uh, we have to change or we have to add vaginal progesterone, that then can affect uh, how estrogen is absorbed. And based on the studies that we have, not in women with female endometria, unfortunately, the literature um, is uh, very scant when it comes to women with female endometria, but from frozen embryo transfer cycles, we, we have not been able to find a clear benefit in these women. However, it is considered a sensible approach to use either vaginal or transdermal uh, routes of administration when we want to administer estrogen for a prolonged time and in high doses. What about synthetic estrogen? Ethanol estradiol being um, uh, the most common one, we do know that it's quite resistant to liver metabolism, which means that it can be administered orally, and that leads to greater bioavailability, and it is more potent when it comes to a comparison by weight to estradiol per se. However, we have not been using it in ART as much due to concerns around safety. And I'm sure that you will know many colleagues that have used it in the past and have produced healthy pregnancies, but it has not been extensively trialed and it's not licensed to be used uh, for this reason. Uh, there is one study that I was able to find that tested ethanol estradiol in IUI or OI cycles, where the question was whether ethanol estradiol can reverse the anti estrogenic effect chronophane citrate. And this study was a randomized one involving 54 patients. And in, the, in group one, they received 100 milligrams of uh, chromophene citrate for five days, day three to day seven. And in the second group, the same chromophene citrate, but they additionally uh, added after 
from day eight until day 12 for another five days, 15 micrograms of ethylene estradiol. And as you can see on the chart on the left, there was significant increase in endometrial thickness in the group that had uh, received uh, uh, the ethylene estradiol. And um, interestingly, uh, this study, which is a small but yet randomized study, reported that there was a significant, a quite impressive, to be honest, effect in pregnancy rates with ongoing pregnancy jumping from 6.3% to 37.5%. Unfortunately, um, this is a small study and not many studies have followed since then. Some have shown similar trends, but we're far from being able to conclude uh, that this is something that we need to routinely use. What about alternative hormonal treatments for women with thin endometrium? As we said, selective estrogen receptor modulators, and particularly those that can induce endometrial proliferation, like tamoxifen, has been used. ACG injections, administration of mid luteal generate agonist, and growth hormone. These are another four interventions that have been proposed, and I would like just to go through um, uh, with you in the next few slides. So um, we do know that selective estrogen receptor modulators have anti-estrogenic effects on the breast, like tamoxifen, but at the same time does have a proliferative effect on the endometrium. That's a very common knowledge. So on the basis of this, some uh, individuals consider that that might actually be a great um, uh, molecule to try and use in women with thin endometrium. So this is a prospective study published by Ken in Reproductive Sciences just a couple of years ago, where they um, uh, included 226 women with previous thin endometrium defined as less than 7.5 millimeters. And uh, this was a, a cohort study without any uh, control group, but they used historical controls. So they administered 20 milligrams of tamoxifen uh, from day two, day three to day eight of a cycle, and then added also one milligram of uh, 17 beta estradiol from day five. And depending on what type of treatment these patients were undergoing, either it was a natural cycle for a frozen embryo transfer, an HRT group, or an, or an ovulation induction group, in every single case, they uh, show that compared to the previous month, there was a quite, quite significant increase in the endometrial thickness. And uh, that obviously um, is quite interesting. However, as we do know, um, these type of studies using historical controls have their limitations and should be interpreted with great caution. What about ACG injection for women with thin endometria? We know that ACG is a glycoprotein, which is produced by the syncytiotrophoblast and is essential for the establishment of pregnancy. And we have found ACG LH receptors in the endometrium. So there has been a proof of concept trial in 2013, uh, where in women with less than six millimeters endometrial thickness, they decided to administer 150 international units per day of ACG for four, seven days starting after eight days of using eight milligrams uh, per day of estradiol. And they noted, the, these authors noted some benefits on endometrial thickness. This was a very small trial. However, this is just a single trial, and most importantly, a similar trial that had been performed a few years back suggested that slightly higher dose of ACG every three days, but again, the proliferative phase of a program with um, uh, oocyte recipients did indeed lead to reduced pregnancy rates uh, but I have, to, uh, I have to actually point out that this second study was not performed in women with thin endometria. The recipients uh, were uh, actually had normal endometrium. It, uh, that uh, intervention was trialed because they thought that it would augment, that would enhance the chances of conception, and it actually showed the exact opposite. So this is an intervention uh, that still remains quite uncertain, and um, we need more evidence in order to be able to suggest it. What about mid luteal generator antagonists for women uh, within endometrium? Can such an intervention improve the outcome? A randomized controlled trial involving 120 uh, women with endometrial thickness of less than seven millimeters on the day of ACG has been performed, in which they compared triptorelin uh, 0.1 milligrams on the day of OPU on the day of the embryo transfer and three days after embryo transfer compared with placebo. And what they observed was that the endometrial thickness uh, on the day of LPU was 6.9 and 6.8, so very, very similar and no difference there. But on the day of ET, already they, sh they, they were able to observe a significant uh, increase in the endometrial thickness 
uh, in uh, the women that had received the generates agonist. It went up to 8.92, whereas the placebo was 7.12, and that was statistically significant. And equally impressive was the fact that live birth rate in this uh, randomized controlled trial was significantly higher in women that had received generates agonist, in women with female endometria, 31.6, versus just 5% in women that had received placebo. This is a rather interesting study because it's, it has a respectable size and at the same time, uh, uh, and at the same time, it leads not just to an endometrial thickness increase, which might be something uh, more susceptible to bias, measurement bias, but also according to the authors to uh, black birth rate. And that's very impressive. Uh, having said that, since 2008 that the study has been published, uh, it has never been repeated. So we don't actually know whether it would be truly beneficial. Finally, uh, a, a recent study uh, uh, has used growth hormone for women with thin endometria. We do know that growth hormone promotes IGF-1, which promotes the anabolic state in a variety of tissues. And the GH receptor mRNA has been localized in human myonutrient and in myomas. And we do know that the growth hormone has a mitogenic effect in endometrial cells. Uh, growth hormone receptor has been found to be expressed also at the endometrial glandular cells. On the basis of um, these, uh, these uh, uh, characteristics of growth hormone and the fact that you can find receptors in the endometrium, uh, Sui et al. published fairly recently in the Journal of uh, Endocrine Investigations, a randomized study of 93 women with endometrium less than seven uh, millimeters. And in one group, they just received or estradiol plus five units of growth hormone per day. Whereas in the other group, they just received oral estradiol in the same dose. And as you can see on the graph on the left-hand side, uh, there was a significant increase in the endometrial thickness from around six to almost up to eight, whereas this um, significant increase was not observed in the endometrial thickness in the placebo group. At the same time, once again, we see a, significant, um, a significantly higher clinical pregnancy rates having been achieved in uh, women that did receive growth hormone compared to women that did not. 42.5 versus 18.9. Again, interesting data, but just preliminary data from a single randomized study from the center. And uh, we need to make sure that these data are uh, confirmed in future studies. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, what are the take home messages? We do know that thin endometrium represents a birth therapeutic challenge. Its incidence has been estimated when you take uh, seven millimeters, the cutoff around 2.4% in stimulated ART cycles. The endometrial growth is primarily promoted by estrogen. Therefore, several estrogenic manipulations have been proposed by clinicians. Unfortunately, not many have been tested in the context of uh, uh, properly conducted trials. The available evidence is, limiting that is limited and originates from small observational studies or case series case reports in the majority of the situations. Natural oral estradiol with doses up to 16 milligrams per day and duration up to nine weeks have been proposed. However, we need to always think rationally and consider the risk of hyperplasia, of cardiovascular disease, rectal bleeding, and thromboembolic events. Vaginal transdermal roots uh, might be a better way to administer estrogen for a prolonged uh, period of time or at the high doses since they bypass the first pass effect. And uh, however, in, we don't have any evidence on thin endometria per se, but we do know that in terms of pregnancy rate, when we look back in frozen embryo transfer cycles, there has, been, there has not been any clear benefit. The evidence, as I said again, is scarce, so we need to take uh, uh, this, uh, uh, we need to interpret this uh, appropriately. Tamoxifen, ACG injection, middle TLG generous agonist, and growth hormone recently, have all been trialed in very small studies, some prospective, a couple of randomized trials, and the outcomes are very intriguing and promising. However, uh, the findings need to be confirmed in larger trials before any recommendation can be made regarding their use in clinical practice. And if there is one message from this uh, uh, presentation is that despite the fact that we have seen most of us, many patients within endometrium, manipulating and uh, trying to uh, trying to address that uh, problem using specific therapeutic interventions uh, that are hormonal in nature have not been trialed properly. And we need to do better in that regard 
because in some cases we might actually be able to offer a meaningful improvement. With that message, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm very happy to join you at the end of the session for a discussion. Thank you.